The air cover at Buna was far below our needs, but the fighters managed to prevent any large-scale attacks from destroying the beachhead facilities. Buna was a shock to me on my first patrol. I had seen many landing operations before from the air, but never had I witnessed such a pathetic attempt to supply a full infantry division. Soldiers milled around on the beach, carrying cases of supplies into the jungle by hand. Only two small transports with a single small sub-chaser as their escort stood off the beach unloading new supplies. Flying cover for the beachhead proved eventually more difficult than anticipated. No longer did heavy cloud layers mean a day of comparative rest. On July 22nd, in a group of six zeros, we flew wide circles in what appeared to be an otherwise empty sky. A thick overcast hung at 7,000 feet above the ground. Without warning, a series of tremendous explosions rocked the beach area and columns of flame and smoke erupted into the sky. Seconds later, thick, greasy smoke boiled out of the critical supply dumps several hundred yards off the shore. No other planes could be seen. Either they had dropped their bombs through the overcast with spectacular accuracy, which seemed highly unreasonable, or one or more planes had dropped below the clouds, released their bombs, and slipped back into the protection of the grey mass without being seen. The latter proved to be the case, for several minutes later I caught sight of a tiny speck moving out of the edge of the overcast, far to the southeast. We turned and pursued the fleeing plane, which, as we drew closer, was identifiable as our old friend, the twin-engine Lockheed Hudson. We were about a mile away when we were sighted, the bomber nosed down and fled along the coast, trying to make Rabi. Its speed was high, almost as great as that of our own fighters. I jettisoned the fuel tank and pushed the throttle to maximum overboost. From a distance of 600 yards and to the rear left, I fired a burst from all four guns at the plane, hoping the Hudson would turn and allow me to lessen the distance between our two planes. What happened next was startling. No sooner had I fired then the Hudson went up in a steep climbing turn to the right, rolled quickly, and roared back with full speed directly at me. I was so surprised that for several moments I sat motionless in the cockpit. The next second every forward-firing gun in the Hudson opened up in a withering barrage, our zeros scattered wildly, rolling or diving in different directions. Nothing like this had ever happened before. I caught a glimpse of Lieutenant Sasai. His jaw hung open in astonishment at the audacity of the enemy pilot. One zero piloted by Nishizawa, who refused to be impressed by anything rolled out of his sudden breakaway, and came down behind the bomber, his guns spitting flame. Again we were astounded. The Hudson heeled over in a snap roll, the fastest I had ever seen for a twin-engine plane. Nishizawa's guns sprayed only empty air. The remaining pilots, myself included, hurled our planes at the Hudson, all of us failed to score a single hit. The bomber rolled and soared up and down in violent manoeuvres, with the top gunner firing steadily at our planes. The Zero pilots went wild with fury. Our formation disintegrated, and every man went at the Hudson with everything he had. I made at least four firing passes, and was forced to break off my attack by other pilots who screamed in without regard for their wingmates. For nearly ten minutes we pursued the Hudson, pouring a hail of lead and explosive shells at the amazing plane. Finally, a heavy burst caught the rear turret. I saw the gunner throw his hands up and collapse. Without the interfering stream of bullets from the turret, I closed in to twenty yards and held the gun trigger down, aiming for the right wing. Seconds later, flame streamed out, then spread to the left wing. The pilot stayed with the ship. It was too low for him or the crew to bail out, the Hudson lost speed rapidly and glided in toward the jungle. Trees sheared off the two flaming wings and the fuselage, also trailing great sheets of flame, burst into the dense growth like a giant sliver of burning steel. There was a sudden explosion and smoke boiled upward. The day was full of surprises. We were on our way back to Ley to resume the beachhead patrol when five Aero Cobras attempted a surprise attack against our formation, the enemy planes flew in a long column low over the water, attempting to climb rapidly and catch us unawares. I was the first to sight the enemy group. I went into a steep turn and dove for the Aerocobras, heading directly at the lead plane. Abruptly the five P-39 scattered in all directions, turned and raced away. With their advantage of surprise gone, 
and five other zeros directly behind me. They wanted no part of a battle in which they were at a height disadvantage. With the speed from my dive, I was soon among the enemy group. Two fighters zoomed wildly and disappeared into low-hanging clouds. Another disappeared within a shower of rain, and yet another seemed to have vanished into thin air. One air cobra was still in the clear, and I went after the fighter at maximum speed. He was heading for clouds, but a burst across his nose changed his mind. The P-39 flicked over in a left roll and dove for the sea with me 200 yards behind. It was the new model Aero Cobra, which at sea level was equal in speed to my own fighter. But the pilot had made a fatal error he was flying in the wrong direction. Instead of fleeing to Moresby, he was headed in exactly the opposite direction. I still had plenty of fuel, and was content to maintain the distance between our planes all the way to Rabul, if necessary. Several minutes later, the American pilot came to his senses and realised his error. He had no choice but to reverse his course, and the fighter winged over in a sharp left bank and turn. This had happened many times before. I cut inside his turn, moving in slightly below and to the left of the fighter. A short burst sent the Aero Cobra rolling violently to escape my fire. I clung to his tail as he whipsawed back and forth, heading for the coastline. For precious seconds I lost the fighter when he went through some unusually wild manoeuvres, and the P-39 raced away for his home base, with several hundred yards distance between our two planes. Even with the engine on over boost I could not close the distance between us. I was almost ready to turn away. So long as the P-39 kept a straight and true course, it was impossible for me to reach firing position. The enemy pilot chose otherwise. Instead of staying over the sea... He headed directly for the Owen Stanley Mountains, which forced him into a climb. And no P-39 could outclimb a zero. Slowly but steadily, I closed the distance between us. I held my fire for a burst at the closest possible range, with my ammunition low after the battle with the Hudson. I would have enough for only one or two quick bursts, fifty yards. Then it shrunk to forty, then thirty. I gripped the gun trigger, aiming carefully. I had not fired a single shot when the pilot bailed out of the fighter. The Aero Cobra was less than 150 feet above the ground when his form tumbled into the air, in a drop which seemed to be certain death. I knew of no instance where a pilot had survived a bailout from less than 300 feet. Miraculously, the chute snapped open a split second before the pilot struck the ground. He dropped into a small clearing while his fighter exploded a scant few yards in front of him, I still could not believe that the enemy pilot had lived through his incredible descent. I turned steeply and flew back over the jungle clearing. Only the parachute was visible. The pilot had lived and was in good enough condition to flee from sight. It was my second victory without firing a shot and raised my total to 49 planes. The next few weeks were spent in maintaining cover over the Buna Beach area, but the latter half of July meant a new and strange phase of the war for us. No longer did we fly without parachutes, orders had come down from higher headquarters, and Captain Saito directed every pilot to wear his chute into combat. It was a strange sensation to feel the chute packed on my seat below me, and the straps around my body. I had never flown with one before. Equally disturbing to us were further orders which carried unspoken but ominous implications. We were taken off the offensive, Captain Saito issued orders that from now on no fighters would cross the Owen Stanley range, no matter how compelling the reason. Only on one occasion, July 26th, did I see Port Moresby again. We had intercepted five marauders over Buna, and during the running fight as the bombers fled for home, I shot two B-26 out of the air, kills confirmed by the other pilots. With Sasai and Endo behind me, I pursued the remaining bombers, crossing the mountain range against orders. I shot up one bomber, but failed to see it crash, and received only a probable. That was the last time I ever flew over the enemy base. Our situation was changing rapidly. By the end of the first week in August, we began to fight under conditions we had never before known. The Americans had launched a tremendous invasion of Guadalcanal Island. On July 29th, Lieutenant Joji Yamashita returned to Leh from his Buna patrol, with news which electrified the entire base. His planes had been attacked for the first time by American naval aircraft. He reported to Commander Nakajima and Captain Saito 
that his nine zeros had encountered a mixed force of American SBD Dauntless dive bombers and F-4F Wildcat fighters, led to the Buna area by P-39 Pathfinders, which he estimated had come from Rabi. The Navy warplanes were the first to appear in our theatre. The news that an American aircraft carrier had moved into New Guinea waters was ominous, and our staff officers appeared upset. If the Americans had carriers to spare for operations against our forces at Ley, Buna and Rabul, then there appeared to be some truth in their claims of victory at Midway and their denials of major losses during the Coral Sea battle. If what Tokyo had claimed was true, that our fleet had destroyed the enemy carriers encountered in the Coral Sea and off Midway, how could there be a carrier in our vicinity? Something was wrong, and for the first time we felt doubts regarding the authenticity of Tokyo's repeated claims of victory. The majority of fighter pilots at Lai, however, greeted the news in an entirely different fashion. Late into the night we threw questions at Yamashita's pilots. How many Navy planes were there? Were the Wildcats better than the P-39 and the P-40? How good were the American Navy pilots? Their answers were encouraging, for Yamashita's squadron put in claims for three dive bombers, five fighters, and one P-39 definitely shot down, without the loss of a single zero. This made unimportant what might have happened at Midway, or at the Coral Sea, or anywhere else. All we cared about was that for four successive months, we had whipped the enemy's fighters and bombers time and time again, and that the appearance of his navy planes meant that much greater an opportunity for gaining even more victories. But for the next three days, the new enemy planes failed to appear over Buna. On the 30th, 9B-17 attacked the beachhead area with considerable success, and our nine fighters managed to shoot down only one bomber of the enemy formation. I received credit for the victory when I caught the fourth fortress over Cape Nelson and managed to concentrate my fire into its nose. Apparently the pilot and co-pilot were killed, for the big airplane plunged into the ocean out of control. It was one of my hardest air battles, for I returned to Ley with several inches of skin scraped off my right arm from the bomber's guns. I had missed death by no more than the thickness of a hair, and my mechanics worked all night to patch up the dozens of bullet holes in the fuselage and wings. On August 2nd, all thoughts of Navy planes fled from our minds. Before the day was over, we had behind us a tremendous occasion to remember the dream of all Japanese fighter pilots come true. We were circling over Buna at 12,000 feet when we sighted five tiny specks against the clouds several miles away from the beachhead. They were at our height and they appeared to be fortresses. I flew alongside Sasai's plane and indicated the oncoming bombers. He nodded and we both pointed out the B-17s to the other pilots. We kept our formation circling slowly until the four engines of each bomber became clearly visible. Sasai signalled us to follow him. He raised his right hand, rocked his wings to give the order to break up our V formations into a single column for a head-on attack. Our fuel tanks tumbled through the air. Now was our chance to put to the acid test the theories we had worked out in our billets at night. In a few moments we would know whether or not the fortresses were vulnerable to the head-on attack. The situation was perfect. Nine Zero fighters against five of the great B-17s, and among that nine we had the leading aces of all Japan. Sasai led the attack, Ota dropped 500 yards behind his plane, followed by Endo. I slipped into fourth position, also at a 500-yard distance, and my wingmen Yonakawa and Hatori followed me as numbers five and six in the column. Nishizawa took seventh place, then Takatsuka, and finally naval aviation pilot Yoshio Sueyoshi in the rear slot. Nine zeros, spread out over a distance of 4,000 yards and carrying the best pilots Japan had produced. The fortresses tightened their formation as we closed in. Sasai's fighter dropped below the lead bomber, then climbed at a shallow angle, rolling slowly as he aimed at the lower nose section of the plane. The next second he flashed up and over as he completed his firing run. Smoke trailed from all five bombers, but it was the smoke of their 50 caliber guns. The enemy formation continued on, then Ota made his bid, following exactly the same manoeuvre as Sasai. I watched the flashes of his tracers as they bit into the lead bomber, then Ota's wing lifted up as he began his breakaway turn. 
The next instant a violent explosion hid every plane from view. A flash of intense light appeared in the sky, followed by a tremendous smoke cloud. Even from a half-mile distance the shockwave jolted my own fighter. The B-17 was no longer in the sky. It had disappeared, shattered into small pieces of wreckage when its full bomb load went off under the impact of Otter's cannon shells. It was the most spectacular air kill I had ever seen, and I cheered loudly as Otter's Zero rocketed upward through the smoke. By now, Endo was in his firing run, diving and climbing upward at a shallow angle. The Zero rolled slowly as it raced against the bombers, both cannon and machine guns spitting out flame as he closed in. His tracers went wild and Endo went for altitude as the bomber guns bracketed him in a heavy crossfire. My turn now. I pulled back gently on the stick, and the third fortress in the formation expanded slowly in my rangefinder. Closer and closer he came, and I squeezed the trigger, nothing happened. The bomber seemed to fill the entire sky before me before I found out what was wrong. Stupid. I had failed to release the safety lock on the trigger, an error not even the greenest pilot would make. It was almost my undoing, and I rolled violently to clear the B-17 at a distance of only twenty yards. Their gunners had me in a crossfire. The Zero lurched as bullets slammed into the fuselage, and I felt the shock of the heavy slugs ripping through metal. I was frantic now, and with my fighter's belly up, I held the stick over hard to the left, rolling wildly. I was through, but not without damage. I raged at my own stupidity. But it was too late. I had wasted a perfect firing pass. I dropped below the enemy formation and gunned the engine to overboost to race ahead of the bombers for another run. Nishizawa was already climbing against his B-17. He went in beautifully, his fighter arcing up slowly in its gradual climb, rolling steadily as the distance narrowed between his fighter and the enemy plane. His attack was perfect as he kept pouring cannon shells into the wing fuel tanks. Abruptly a splash of flame burst through the wing, spread rapidly, and in a few seconds the fortress seemed to turn into a gigantic flamethrower. Brilliant fire streamed into the wind from the wing and along the fuselage. The plane skidded wildly, and its nose dropped. Then it was gone. Another mighty explosion flipped Nishizawa's fighter over on its back like a toy and rocked my own Zero sharply. The other bombers reeled under the shock wave, even as the remaining fighters screamed by on their firing passes. Now Sasai went in again, raking a third bomber from nose to tail. He started firing from a distance of almost 150 yards, and his shells slowly moved back along the fuselage. Pieces of metal erupted from the plane and flipped away in the slipstream. The airplane rolled wildly to the right, out of control. I saw flames within the fuselage, licking out of the cockpit and the second gun turret. The B-17 dropped in a long, sweeping turn, rolling and skidding as it descended, the sure sign of a dead pilot and co-pilot. The flames increased, and for the third time in two minutes, another roaring explosion marked the finish of the third B-17. I could hardly believe my eyes. These were the planes which had been driving our fighter pilots frantic wherever they appeared. And now, one, two, three, three blasting detonations, and as many fortresses just so many small pieces of charred wreckage falling from the sky. The two surviving bombers split up as I came in for my second pass, and I found only empty space in my rangefinder. I went up and over in a high loop, coming out to see the two B-17s racing away in different directions. One headed for the mountains and the other turned for the open sea. I went after the plane racing for the water. The B-17 rolled and turned continuously as I tried for a long burst at the cockpit or fuel tanks. For some strange reason, the bombardier failed to jettison his lethal load, and the plane fled under the weight penalty of all its bombs. I dove to gain speed and came up beneath the bomber, closing in toward the left wing. The B-17 grew larger and larger in my sight, and I opened up, watching the shells exploding along the left wing by the fuselage and chewing up the metal skin as they moved toward the bomb bay. The world was blotted out in the next instant. A bolt of light, searing and intense, filled the sky, blinding me. A great fist gripped the Zero and flipped it wildly through the air. My ears rang and I tasted blood trickling down from my nose. The fourth fortress was gone. Everyone had been destroyed by its own bombs. Now only one remained. 
The bomber fled for the mountains, eight zeros clawing at the great plain like hunting dogs after a massive wild boar. They were hard-pressed to keep up with the B-17, which evidently had jettisoned its bombs and had gained speed. The B-17's course, cutting across my nose, gave me a chance to intercept the airplane before it reached land. My decision was fortunate indeed. No sooner had I turned and pushed the throttle all the way forward than I sighted three Aero Cobras rushing down from the east, skimming over the water, obviously answering the distress calls of the fortresses. They closed in on the eight pursuing Zeros, which had no warning of their approach. It was a unique situation. The three P-39 began climbing after eight unsuspecting Zero fighters, and I came around in a wide sweeping turn on the three unsuspecting enemy planes. The first P-39 moved into firing position against the last Zero when I hit him in a shallow dive. The enemy pilot never knew what happened. Bullets and cannon shells smashed into his fuselage at the wing roots, and the airplane disintegrated, one wing flipping wildly through the air. My gun reports carried to the other Zeros, and at once two fighters clawed around in a tight spiral and fell upon the other two, P-39. It was over in seconds. I recognised the planes of our two peerless aces, Nishizawa and Ota. Each pilot fired but one heavy burst, and the Aero Cobras fell in flames. The three enemy pilots had attacked three times their number in Zero fighters. Regrettably, their skill failed to match their courage. But there was still unfinished business in the air the lone surviving fortress, which now turned from the land and headed back for the sea. Its speed was visibly reduced, and with its crippled engines it was only a matter of time before we cut the bomber out of the air. I had barely come out of a long climb after pulling out of my dive against the Aero Cobra when the B-17 moved before my nose. It happened too suddenly to enable me to aim properly, but I snapped out a heavy burst. The shells went wild, and I rolled up and turned to come back for another attack. The crippled fortress was still full of fight. I was climbing past the bomber, watching the tracers arcing through the air after me, when suddenly the Zero shuddered violently. The sounds of hammers beating against metal startled me, and something shook me wildly in the cockpit. My right hand went numb. The Zero skidded crazily, its belly up, and flipped downward out of control. I searched the instruments with fear, but the engine kept up its powerful drone. No flame or smoke. Relief swept over me, for I was prepared to go over the side if necessary. A burning zero doesn't stay in one piece for very long. I was less than thousand feet over the water when I brought the fighter out of its careening plunge. The plane had been hit badly, but its vital parts had not been damaged. Back in normal flying position, I looked at my right hand. A piece of metal was sticking through the glove where it had penetrated the palm. Good fortune was certainly with me today. The jagged piece of metal had been ripped loose by a passing bullet, but without enough energy to cause any serious injury. The fortress lost altitude steadily, trailing a long streamer of white smoke. The Zeros kept at the bomber in their long column, each one snapping out a burst as the pilot dove against the crippled bomber. One fighter broke away from the pack harassing the B-17, it went into a wide, lazy turn and began a gradual descent across the island coastline. A thin white film trailed in the air behind it. The plane did not seem to be seriously damaged. Its wings were level, but it lost altitude and speed steadily. I turned and glanced at the bomber, which now plunged toward the sea, obviously out of control. By the time I looked again for the lone zero, the airplane was gone. A wild ovation greeted us at Ley as we told the mechanics of our destruction of five flying fortresses. The men leaped and shouted in glee as they heard the details. Five fortresses and three Aero Cobras, an excellent day. Nishizawa was the seventh pilot to land. He climbed out of his cockpit and ignored the hilarious cheers of his ground crew. He asked one question. Where's Sueyoshi? Silence fell on the crowd. Where is my wingman? Nishizawa demanded. Takatsuka climbed from his fighter and walked silently up to Nishizawa. Hasn't Salamawa radioed in? Nishizawa cried. What's the matter with all of you? Hasn't there been any word? Nishizawa went wild. There had been no news from Salamawa, and no one had seen Sueyoshi's fighter after it dropped toward the coast. Refuel my plane and load my guns, Nishizawa ordered. We tried to dissuade him from going out on what seemed to be a hopeless search, but Nishizawa would not be dissuaded. 
Two hours later he returned, misery written on his face. Sueyoshi, one of the most popular young flyers at Lai, was never found. The day's victory turned bitter in our mouths. On August 3rd, Rabul called back most of the Zero fighters assigned to Lai. We welcomed the transfer, for it promised relief from the daily patrols over Buna and an escape from the nightly bombings. We left behind us at Lai our personal belongings, fully believing we would soon return. We were wrong. Our first four days at Rabaul, we flew reconnaissance and fighter sweep flights to Rabi, which rapidly had been built up into a major enemy fighter nest comparable to Moresby. On August 8th, after receiving our patrol orders from the command post, we started walking across the airfield to our fighters. Most of the 18 pilots were in their cockpits when orderlies ran after us, shouting that the flight had been cancelled. We were to report back at once to the command post. The command post was in a wild turmoil. Orderlies and messengers ran to and from, and the officers who passed us wore worried expressions on their faces. Commander Nakajima, who was to lead today's mission, came out of the Admiral's room, obviously angry, and shouted to us, Today's mission has been called off. We're going somewhere else. He looked around the room. Where the hell is that orderly? You, pointing to a startled messenger, get me a chart, quick. He spread the map on a large desk and began plotting a course with a compass. He paid no attention to any of the pilots as he pored over the map. I asked Lieutenant Sasai if he knew what had happened. Sasai questioned Nakajima, received a curt explanation, and rushed into the Admiral's rooms without speaking to any of us. Several minutes later he returned and signalled the pilots to gather about him. His words were like a bombshell. At 5.20am this morning, a powerful enemy amphibious force began an invasion at Lunga, on the southern end of Guadalcanal Island. Our first reports indicate that the Americans are throwing a tremendous number of men and equipment onto the island. They also have struck in simultaneous attacks at Tulagi on Florida Island. Our entire flying boat flotilla has been destroyed. As soon as the commander has worked out our new routes, we will take off at once for Guadalcanal to attack the enemy forces on the beaches. Orderlies passed out charts of the islands to each pilot. We studied the maps, searching for the unfamiliar island which had so suddenly become important. The men murmured among themselves, Where is that damned island anyway? cried one exasperated pilot. Who ever heard of such a crazy place? We checked the distance from Rabul to Guadalcanal. There were low whistles of disbelief, 560 miles. We would have to fly that distance to the enemy beachhead, engage his fighters, and then fly the same mileage back to Rabul. The distance was unheard of. It meant a round-trip flight of more than 1,100 miles, without allowance for combat or storms, which would consume fuel in prodigious quantities. That was enough to stop all speculation. We waited silently for the commander to lift his head and give us our new orders. In the meantime, one orderly after the other rushed into the Admiral's office with fresh reports from the battlefront. We heard one messenger tell Nakajima that all contact had been lost with Tulagi, that the garrison had died to the last man. Sasai turned pale at the news. I had to ask him several times if anything was wrong. Finally, staring straight ahead, he spoke quietly. My brother-in-law was assigned to Tulagi. There was no denying the certainty of his words, he referred to his sister's husband in the past tense. If Tulagi was now occupied by the enemy, then his brother-in-law, Lieutenant Commander Yoshio Tashiro, a flying boat commander, could no longer be among the living. He would fight to the last. His death was confirmed later. Nakajima called for order. You are going to fly the longest fighter operation in history, he warned us. Don't take any unnecessary chances today. Stick to your orders, and above all, don't fly recklessly and waste your fuel. Any pilot who runs short of fuel on the return from Guadalcanal is to make a forced landing at Buka Island. Our troops there have been instructed to be on the lookout for our planes. Now, to fly to Guadalcanal and return to Buka means covering roughly the same distance as we flew from Tainan to Clark Field in the Philippines, and return. I am positive that we can fly that distance without trouble. Returning to Rabul is another matter. You should be able to make it, but there may be trouble, so I repeat my warning, don't waste fuel. Commander Nakajima told me in Tokyo after the war that the Admiral wished him to take to Guadalcanal on August 7th every Zero fighter at Rabaul which could fly. 
Nakajima protested and offered instead to take the twelve best pilots in his wing, because he expected to lose at least half of his men during a mission of such extreme range. A bitter argument raged between the two men until they reached a compromise on the figure of eighteen fighter planes, with the understanding that the stragglers who landed on Buka were to be picked up later. As soon as we had our orders, the pilots broke up into trios. I told Yonakawa and Hattori, my two wingmen, you'll meet the American Navy flyers for the first time today. They are going to have us at a distinct advantage because of the distance we have to fly. I want you both to exercise the greatest caution in every move you make. Above all, never break away from me. No matter what happens, no matter what goes on around us, stick as close to my plane as you can. Remember that don't break away. We ran out to our planes and waited for the runways to be cleared. Twenty-seven Betty bombers thundered down the airstrip before us. Commander Nakajima waved his hand over his cockpit. By 8.30am, all the fighters were airborne. The maintenance crew and the pilots who were not flying that day lined both sides of the runway, waving their caps and shouting good luck to us. The weather was perfect, especially for Rabul. Even the volcano was quiet. Its eruptions had ended in June, and only a thin streamer of smoke drifted to the west. We took up our escort positions behind the bombers. I was surprised to see that the Bettys carried bombs instead of torpedoes, the usual armament for attacking shipping. The bombs disturbed me. I knew the problems of hitting moving targets on the sea from high altitude. Even the B-17, despite their vaunted accuracy, wasted most of their bombs when attacking the shipping off Buna. We gained height slowly, then flew to the east at 13,000 feet for Buka Island. About 60 miles south of Rabul, I noticed a particularly beautiful island on the water. Brilliantly green and in the shape of a horseshoe, the atoll was listed on the map as Green Island. I had no idea that the eye-catching qualities of the colourful atoll would later prove the key to saving my life. Over Buka, the formations turned and flew south along Bougainville's west coast. The sun beat down warmly through the canopy. The heat made me thirsty. And since we still had some time before reaching the enemy area, I took out a bottle of soda from my lunchbox. Without thinking, I opened the bottle. I had forgotten the altitude. No sooner had I made a slit in the cork than the soda water geysered violently, the pressure escaping in the rarefied air. In seconds, the sticky soda water was over everything in front of me. Fortunately, the strong cockpit draught dried it almost immediately. But the sugar in the soda water dried on my glasses, and I was unable to see. Disgusted with my own stupidity, I rubbed the goggles. I could see dimly. For the next forty minutes I struggled to clean not only my goggles, but the windscreen and the controls as well. I had never felt more ridiculous. My fighter wandered all over the formation as I scrubbed with increasing irritation. By the time I could see clearly in all directions, we were already over Vela La Vela about midway between Rabul and Guadalcanal. Over New Georgia we went for higher altitude and crossed Russell at 20,000 feet. Fifty miles ahead of us, Guadalcanal loomed out of the water. Even at this distance I saw flashes of yellow flame against the blue sky over the disputed island. Apparently battles were already underway between Zero fighters from bases other than Rabaul and the defending enemy planes. I looked down at Guadalcanal's northern coastline, in the channel between Guadalcanal and Florida, hundreds of white lines, the wakes of enemy ships, crisscrossed the water. Everywhere I looked, there were ships. I had never seen so many warships and transports at one time. This was my first look at an American amphibious operation. It was almost unbelievable. I saw at least 70 ships pushing toward the beaches, a dozen destroyers cutting white swathes through the water around them and there were other ships on the horizon, too far distant to make out in detail or to count. Meanwhile, the bombers swung slowly for their runs. Dead ahead of them, small clouds drifted at 13,000 feet. To our right and above was the sun, its blinding glare blotting everything from view. I was uncomfortable. We would be unable to see any fighters dropping from that angle. My fear was soon realised. Without warning, six fighter planes emerged from that glare, almost as if they had suddenly appeared in the sky. A snap glance revealed that they were chubbier than the other American planes we had fought. They were painted olive green, and only the lower sides of the wings were white. Wildcats. 
The first Grumman F4F fighters I had seen, the Wildcats ignored the Zeros, swooping down against the bombers. Our fighters raced ahead, many of them firing from beyond effective range, hoping to distract the enemy planes. The Wildcats plunged into the bomber formation, rolling together and then disappeared in dives. Over the water just off Savo Island, the bombers released their missiles against a large convoy. I watched the bombs curving in their long drop. Abruptly, geysers of water erupted from the sea, but the enemy shipping sailed on undisturbed. It was obviously stupid to try to hit moving ships from four miles up. I could not understand the failure to use torpedoes, which had proven so effective in the past. Our entire mission had been wasted, thrown away in a few seconds of miserable bombing inaccuracy. The following day, the bombers returned, this time carrying torpedoes for low-level attacks, but by then it was too late. Enemy fighters swarmed all over the bombers, and many fell blazing into the ocean even before they could reach their targets. The bomber formation banked to the left and picked up speed for the return to Rabul. We escorted them as far as Russell, beyond the enemy fighter patrols, and turned back for Guadalcanal. It was about 1.30pm, we swept over Lunga, the 18 zeros poised for combat. Again, bursting out of the blinding sun, wildcats plunged against our planes. I was the only pilot who spotted the diving attack, and at once I hauled the fighter up in a steep climb, and the other planes followed me. Again the wildcats scattered and dove in different directions. Their evasive tactics were puzzling, for nothing had been gained by either side. Apparently the Americans were not going to pick any fights today. I turned back to check the positions of my wingmen. They were gone. Things weren't as obvious as they seemed. The enemy would fight after all, I looked everywhere for Yonakawa and Hattori, but could not find them. Sasai's plane, the two blue stripes across its fuselage, regained formation, several other fighters moving up to position behind him. But not my wingmen. Finally I saw them, about 1,500 feet below me. I gaped. A single wildcat pursued three Zero fighters, firing in short bursts at the frantic Japanese planes. All four planes were in a wild dogfight, flying tight left spirals, the Zeros should have been able to take the lone Grumman without any trouble, but every time a Zero caught the Wildcat before its guns, the enemy plane flipped away wildly and came out again on the tail of a Zero. I had never seen such flying before. I banked my wings to signal Sasai and dove. The Wildcat was clinging grimly to the tail of a Zero, its tracers chewing up the wings and tail. In desperation I snapped out a burst. At once the Grummans snapped away in a roll to the right, clawed around in a tight turn, and ended up in a climb straight at my own plane. Never had I seen an enemy plane move so quickly or so gracefully before, and every second his guns were moving closer to the belly of my fighter. I snap-rolled in an effort to throw him off, he would not be shaken. He was using my own favourite tactics, coming up from under. I chopped the throttle back, and the Zero shuddered as its speed fell. It worked. His timing off, the enemy pilot pulled back in a turn, I slammed the throttle forward again, rolling to the left. Three times I rolled the zero, then dropped in a spin and came out in a left vertical spiral. The wildcat matched me turn for turn. Our left wings both pointed at a right angle to the sea below us, the right wings at the sky. Neither of us could gain an advantage. We held to the spiral, tremendous G pressures pushing us down in our seats with every passing second. My heart pounded wildly and my head felt as if it weighed a tonne, a grey film seemed to be clouding over my eyes. I gritted my teeth. If the enemy pilot could take the punishment, so could I. The man who failed first and turned in any other direction to ease the pressure would be finished. On the fifth spiral, the wildcat skidded slightly. I had him, I thought. But the Grumman dropped its nose, gained speed, and the pilot again had his plane in full control. There was a terrific man behind that stick. He made his error, however, in the next moment. Instead of swinging back to go into a sixth spiral, he fed power to his engine, broke away at an angle, and looped. That was the decisive split second. I went right after him, cutting inside the Grumman's arc, and came out on his tail. I had him. He kept flying loops, trying to narrow down the distance of each arc. Every time he went up and around, I cut inside his arc and lessened the distance between our two planes. The Zero could outfly any fighter in the world in this kind of manoeuvre, 
When I was only fifty yards away, the wildcat broke out of his loop and astonished me by flying straight and level. At this distance I would not need the cannon. I pumped two hundred rounds into the Grumman's cockpit, watching the bullets chewing up the thin metal skin and shattering the glass. I could not believe what I saw. The wildcat continued flying almost as if nothing had happened. A zero which had taken that many bullets into its vital cockpit would have been a ball of fire by now. I could not understand it. I slammed the throttle forward and closed in to the American plane, just as the enemy fighter lost speed. In a moment I was ten yards ahead of the wildcat, trying to slow down. I hunched my shoulders, prepared for the onslaught of his guns. I was trapped, no bullets came. The wildcat's guns remained silent, the entire situation was unbelievable. I dropped my speed until our planes were flying wing-to-wing -wing formation. I opened my cockpit window and stared out. The wildcat's cockpit canopy was already back, and I could see the pilot clearly. He was a big man with a round face. He wore a light khaki uniform. He appeared to be middle-aged, not as young as I had expected. For several seconds we flew along in our bizarre formation, our eyes meeting across the narrow space between the two planes. The wildcat was a shambles. Bullet holes had cut the fuselage and wings up from one end to the other. The skin of the rudder was gone, and the metal ribs stuck out like a skeleton. Now I could understand his horizontal flight, and also why the pilot had not fired. Blood stained his right shoulder, and I saw the dark patch moving downward over his chest. It was incredible that his plane was still in the air, but this was no way to kill a man, not with him flying helplessly, wounded, his plane a wreck. I raised my left hand and shook my fist at him, shouting, uselessly I knew, for him to fight instead of just flying along like a clay pigeon. The American looked startled. He raised his right hand weakly and waved. I had never felt so strange before. I had killed many Americans in the air, but this was the first time a man had weakened in such a fashion directly before my eyes, and from wounds I had inflicted upon him. I honestly didn't know whether or not I should try and finish him off. Such thoughts were stupid, of course. Wounded or not, he was an enemy, and he had almost taken three of my own men a few minutes before. However, there was no reason to aim for the pilot again. I wanted the airplane, not the man. I dropped back and came in again on his tail. Somehow the American called upon a reserve of strength and the wildcat jerked upward into a loop. That was it. His nose started up. I aimed carefully at the engine and barely touched the cannon trigger. A burst of flame and smoke exploded outward from his engine. The wildcat rolled and the pilot bailed out. Far below me, almost directly over the Guadalcanal coast, his parachute snapped open. The pilot did not grasp his shroud lines but hung limply in his chute. The last I saw of him he was drifting in toward the beach. The other three Zero fighters quickly reformed on my wings. Yonakawa grinned broadly at me as he slid into position. We climbed and headed back for the island in search of other enemy planes. Anti-aircraft shells began to burst around us. Their aim was sporadic. But the fact that heavy flak guns were already on shore, only hours after the invasion, was upsetting. I knew that our own forces required at least three days following a beach landing to set up their anti-aircraft weapons. The speed at which the Americans moved their equipment ashore was astounding. Long after the day's flight was over, Commander Nakajima filled me in on what had happened to the other 14 Zeros. The enemy Navy fighters held a constant advantage over Guadalcanal. They kept diving in groups of six and twelve planes, always from out of the sun, raising havoc with the Zero formations. Never before had Nakajima and his men encountered such determined opposition or faced an enemy who would not yield. Again and again the plunging wildcats shredded the Zero formation. Every time the wildcats dove, they fired, rolled back and disappeared far below, refusing to allow the Zeros to use to their own advantage their unexcelled manoeuvrability. The tactics were wise, but the Americans' gunnery was sadly deficient. Only one Zero fighter fell before these attacks. It was Nishizawa's day to shine, before his ammunition ran out, the astounding ace in incredible manoeuvres which left his wingmen hopelessly far behind him had shot six Grumman fighters out of the sky. For the first time Nakajima encountered what was to become a famous double-team manoeuvre on the part of the enemy. Two wildcats jumped the commander's plane. He had no trouble in getting on the tail of an enemy fighter, 
but never had a chance to fire before the Grumman's teammate roared at him from the side. Nakajima was raging when he got back to Rabul. He had been forced to dive and run for safety, and Nishizawa and I were the only two pilots in the entire group to down any enemy planes during the day's fighting. Meanwhile, I returned to 7,000 feet with my three fighters behind me. We flew through broken clouds, unable to find any hostile planes. No sooner had we emerged from one cloud than for the first time in all my years of combat, an enemy plane caught me unawares. I felt a heavy thud, the scream of a bullet, and a hole two inches across appeared through the cockpit glass to my left, only inches away from my face. I still had not seen any other planes in the air, it might have been ground fire which hit me. Then I caught a glimpse of an enemy bomber, not a fighter, which had caught me napping. The Dauntless hung on its wing, racing for cloud cover. The audacity of the enemy pilot was amazing. He had deliberately jumped four Zero fighters in a slow and lightly armed dive bomber. In a moment I was on his tail. The Dauntless jerked up and down several times, then dove suddenly into a cloud. I wasn't giving up that easily. I went right in after him. For a few seconds I saw only white as we raced through the billowing mass. Then we were through, in the clear. I closed in rapidly and fired. The rear gunner flung up his hands and collapsed over his gun. I pulled back easily on the stick and the shells walked up to the engine. The SBD rolled repeatedly to the left, then dropped into a wild dive. Yonakawa saw the pilot bail out. It was my sixtieth kill. Back at 13,000 feet, we searched for but failed to find the remainder of our group. A few minutes later, over the Guadalcanal coast, I spotted a cluster of planes several miles ahead of our own. I signalled the other fighters and gunned the engine. Soon I made out eight planes in all, flying a formation of two flights, enemy. Our own planes did not form up into flights in their formations. I was well ahead of the other fighters and kept closing in against the enemy group. I would take the planes on the right and leave the others for the three zeros following. The enemy group tightened formation. Perfect, they appeared to be wildcats, and tightening their formation meant that I had not been sighted. If they kept their positions, I would be able to hit them without warning, coming up from their rear and below. Just another few seconds, I'd be able to get at least two on the first firing pass. I closed in as close as possible. The distance in the rangefinder shrank to 200 yards, then 170, 60. I was in a trap. The enemy planes were not fighters, but bombers, the new Avenger torpedo planes, types I had never seen before. From the rear they looked exactly like wildcats, but now their extra size was visible, as were the top turret with its single gun, and the belly turret with another 50 caliber gun. No wonder they had tightened their formation, they were waiting for me, and now I was caught with eight guns aiming at me from the right and an equal number from the left. I was on engine over boost, and it was impossible to slow down quickly. There was no turning back now. If I turned or looped, the enemy gunners would have a clear shot at the exposed belly of the Zero. I wouldn't stand a chance of evading their fire. There was only one thing to do keep going, and open up with everything I had. I jammed down on the firing button. Almost at the same moment, every gun in the Avenger formation opened up. The chattering roar of the guns and the cough of the cannon drowned out all other sound. The enemy planes were only twenty yards in front of me when flames spurted from two bombers. That was all I saw. A violent explosion smashed at my body. I felt as though knives had been thrust savagely into my ears. The world burst into flaming red and I went blind. The three pilots following me reported to our commander that they saw both Avengers falling from the sky, along with my plane. They stated further that the enemy planes were trailing fire and smoke. These were officially credited to me as my 61st and 62nd air victories. But an official American report of the battle denied any losses of Grumman TBF Avengers operating from the three aircraft carriers southwest of Guadalcanal. Perhaps the two planes made it back to their ships, as my own plane dove, with me unconscious in the cockpit, the three zeros followed me down. They abandoned their chase when my fighter disappeared into a low overcast. Several seconds must have passed before I regained consciousness. A strong, cold wind blowing in through the shattered windshield brought me to. But I was still not in control of my senses. Everything seemed blurred. 
I kept lapsing back into waves of darkness. These swept over me every time I tried to sit up straight. My head was far back, leaning against the headrest. I struggled to see, but the cockpit wavered and danced before my eyes. The cockpit seemed to be open. Actually, the glass had been shattered, and the wind streamed in to jar me back to semi-consciousness. It struck my face. My goggles were smashed. I felt nothing but a soothing, pleasant drowsiness. I wanted to go to sleep. I tried to realise that I had been hit, that I was dying, but I felt no fear. If dying was like this, without pain, there was nothing to worry about. I was in a dream world. A stupor clouded my brain. Visions swam before me. With astonishing clarity, I saw my mother's face. She cried, Shame, shame, wake up, Saburo, wake up. You are acting like a sissy, you are no coward, wake up. Gradually, I became aware of what was happening. The zero plunged earthward like a stone. I forced my eyes open and looked around to see bright red flaming scarlet. I thought the plane was burning, but I could smell no smoke. I was still, I blinked several times. What was wrong? Everything was so red. I groped blindly with my hand, the stick. I had it, still unable to see. I pulled the stick back, gently. The plane began to recover from its wild plummeting. I felt the pressure push me into the seat as the Zero eased out of the dive and returned to what must have been level flight. The wind pressure abated. No longer did it beat with such force against my face. A wild, panicky thought gripped me. I might be blind. I'd never have a chance to return to Rabul. I acted instinctively. I tried to reach forward with my left hand to grip the throttle, to gain more power. I strained, but my hand refused to move. Nothing. In desperation, I tried to clench my fingers. There was no sensation, just numbness. Then I shifted my feet to the rudder bar. Only my right foot moved, and the zero skidded as the bar went down. My left foot was numb. I gritted my teeth and strained. There was no feeling, no sensation of any kind. My whole left side seemed to be paralysed. I tried for several minutes to move my left arm or leg. It was impossible. Still, I did not feel any pain. I could not understand it. I had been hit badly, but I could feel nothing. I would have welcomed pain in my left arm and leg, anything to let me know my limbs were still intact. My cheeks were wet, I was crying. The tears poured out, it helped. Oh, how it helped. The stiffness began to go away. The tears were washing some of the blood out of my eyes. Still, I could not hear anything, but I could see again, just a little, but the red began to fade. The sunlight streaming into the cockpit enabled me to see the outline of the metal posts. The rangefinder was a blur in front of me. It kept improving, and soon I made out the circles of the instruments. They remained fuzzy. Although I could see them, it was impossible to read the dials. I turned my head and looked outside the cockpit. Great black shapes slid past the wings with tremendous speed. They had to be the enemy ships. That meant I was only about 300 feet over the water, then sound came to me. First I heard the drone of the engine, then sharp staccato cracks. The ships were firing at me. The Zero rocked with the blast waves of the bursting flak. Strangely, I did nothing. I sat in the cockpit without even trying to take any evasive action. The sounds of the bursting shells fell away. I could no longer see the black shapes on the water. I had flown out of range. Several minutes passed. Still, I did nothing but sit in the cockpit, with difficulty trying to think. My thoughts came in fitful snatches. I wanted to go to sleep again. Through my stupor, I realised I could never fly all the way back to Rabul. Not the way I felt. I would never even make Buka, less than 300 miles away. For a few minutes, the thought of diving at full speed into the sea attracted me. As the solution to my disability, I was being stupid. I tried to force myself awake. I cursed at myself. This was no way to die if I must die, I thought. I should go out like a man. Was I some untried fledgling who just didn't know how to fight? My thoughts came and went, but I knew that as long as I could control the plane, as long as I could fly, I would do everything in my power to take one or more of the enemies with me. I was silly, but I felt I would be cheating some enemy pilot if I crashed into the sea merely because I accepted the inevitable so readily. I knew the great value of aerial victories to a fighter pilot. If it had to be, why not in combat? Why go out alone and unseen, a silent splash and an explosion heard by no one? I could no longer even rationalise. Where were the fighters I cursed and yelled for the wildcats to appear? 
Come on, I screamed. Here I am. Come on and fight. For several minutes I must have raged like a madman in the cockpit. Slowly I came to my senses. Little by little I realised the ridiculous futility of my actions. I began to appreciate the incredible luck which had kept me alive so far. I had survived many crises before, but none so serious as this. Bullets had ripped by inches away from my head, and more than once had actually grazed my arms, breaking the skin but causing me no further injury. What was the matter with me? I had a chance to live. Why throw it away? And suddenly I wanted to live. I wanted to reach Rabul. The first thing to do, I realised, was to check my wound. I still did not know where I had been hit, or how seriously. I was regaining confidence in myself, finally thinking and acting sanely. But I still could not move my left hand. I snapped my right hand in the air, flinging away the glove. I brought my hand to my head, gingerly, afraid of what I might find. My fingers, moving over the helmet, felt slippery and sticky. I knew it was blood. Then they felt a slit in the helmet on top of my head. The depression was deep and greasy with blood. I moved my fingers down, probing gently. How deep could it be? Something hard met my fingers. I was afraid to accept the truth. My fingers were deep, well past the helmet. That something hard could only be my skull, laid open by bullets, maybe it was cracked. The thought was sickening. Bullets could have reached the brain, but not penetrated deeply. Something I had once read about combat wounds came back to me. The brain cannot feel pain, but maybe the bullets were the cause of the paralysis on my left side. These thoughts came slowly. How can you sit in the cockpit of a damaged airplane, half blind, half paralysed, sticking your fingers through a hole in your head and be objective about the matter? I realised what had happened. I felt the blood and the hole in my head, but I am certain its significance never really penetrated my thoughts. I knew it, that was all. I moved my fingers down over my face. It was puffy and swollen. I felt tears in the skin. Pieces of metal, perhaps, I was not certain. But there was blood there, too, and I felt several loose patches of skin. The Zero droned on, its engine beat steady. My head continued to clear. More and more I acted rationally. I sniffed. No odour of gasoline, so neither the engine nor the fuel tanks had been hit. That was my most cheering realisation since the battle. With the undamaged tanks and a reliable engine, the fighter could have plenty of miles left in it. The wind seemed to increase as my mind cleared. It buffeted at my head. I stared ahead, squinting. The front windshield glass was missing. No wonder it felt so strong. It was beating into the cockpit at more than 200 miles an hour. I felt the blood drying on my face, but the top of my head was still wet and the wind tugged at the deep crease in my skull, which felt as though it were still bleeding. I must plug something into the wound, I knew, or I would soon black out again, this time from loss of blood. Sudden pain engulfed me. My right eye. It began to throb as the pain steadily increased. I felt it with my fingers, and jerked them away. The pain was becoming unbearable. I placed my hand over my right eye again. My vision remained the same. I was blind in the eye.